Hello, how's it going? Hello there. Hi, good to see you. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Hey. Cool. Um, we're right on time. Uh, let's get started. And I would like to start the new year with a very good news. Um, Tone has become a database maintainer uh, before Christmas. And um, really, thank you for that. And congratulations. I'm really looking forward to uh, working together. Um, and I also would like to thank the all, all the people here uh, doing database reviews and being part of that group. I really enjoy working with you. And I think we're on a really good track um, going forward, uh, working on those database topics together. So thank you for that. I don't know who added targets for number of database maintainers. Was that a question or? I, I added. So can you recap the number of maintainers we expect? Um, well, um, I don't. Th I don't think we have like a, um, a set expectation going forward. Um, I think we're doing very well with uh, three maintainers. Uh, but I, I really like to get more. Obviously, um, but we don't have a set number. Um, well, uh, particularly, I would like to be a bit more ambitious on that point. Uh, it will be nice to have at least another two. Uh, by, I don't know, February or March, and then another three, like in May or June, because we keep growing like crazy. And although we have three and three is a good number, I'm not sure we can. Uh, it is going to be a great number in five months from now. Yeah, you can also look at the, there is a page somewhere um, where we have the number of maintainers for backend, frontend, and database. Um, and also the number of engineers uh, joining the company. Um, and obviously, we have to keep up with that growth. Cool. Thanks for the link. Shall we move on to uh, Jason, Adam? Um, yeah, sure. So I was looking at the Grafana a while ago, and I noticed some API endpoints that uh, are heavily used, so around 100 requests per second. And uh, one in particular, the, the pipelines endpoint, uh, I was just checking the response and it was fairly simple. So I thought, why don't we just, we just uh, leverage Postgres for this to, to generate the JSON, basically the JSON response in, in the database and then just provide it as a string for, for Rails to, to render it. And it uh, it seems like it helps quite a bit on the on the response time. So on my local it at least doubles, but I'm fairly sure it could be a bit more. Uh, and the question is for uh, simple responses, sh should we, would it make sense to uh, depend on it, uh, use these kinds of functionality? Since uh, we only use Postgres as a, as a database, um, I guess we could uh, make use of it when it's really needed. Yeah, those are really interesting numbers. Um, I was a bit surprised that Rails is so much slower in that regard. Um, but seeing those numbers, it could really make sense uh, to, to move that into, into Postgres. And you also already hinted at it that uh, we might only want to do that for simple endpoints where we don't have to do a lot of like translation going on in, in, the, in the SQL query. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to put a lot of business logic on the, on the database level, but getting some timestamps out of the database, some string attributes, some numbers uh, without any crazy transformation, then I think it's not high. It, it wouldn't be such a load to, you know, ask to understand actually what's going on. How do we, how do we get this response? So uh, I don't think it would make 
uh, the code base more more complex. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's also worth figuring out what the where we spend most of the time when we when we just use the the Rails uh, serialization, and if there is maybe room to to optimize that as well. Um, yeah, that's that's another. That's, so that is one uh, the the link generation. Uh, so for some API endpoints, we also provide some URLs. Uh, like, hey, what's the URL for this merge request? What's the URL for that specific project? And we also have some uh, serious performance degradation when we actually generate URLs with the Rails Rails helpers, but it's it's being fixed. Right. But I would say the main uh, problem is the, the object allocation in Ruby. So if you just request 100 uh, active record objects, that needs to be allocated depending on the on the row size from the database. A lot of strings needs to be allocated, serialized to JSON. So uh, I expect that you know during uh, an API call, you might get a major GC run just to you know, not to just slow things down. Mm -hmm. Cool. I, I think for just from a database perspective, there is nothing much different, even because we uh, we do the JSON serialization in the database. But that's that's the only change we all, um, and that's not a not a problem, I guess. Any any other comments? Or? So I put this behind the feature flex. So I will. Uh, Try to get it merged and then just see uh, what's the difference and then we can revisit this this topic if we have some actual data in our hand and see where else can we can we improve. Mm -hmm. Cool. Shall we go for slow counting, Alper? Uh, for Adam, uh, I mean, the logical next step is to remove Ruby backend and have Postgres JSON with Vue.js SPA, single page application. I'm kidding. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's most of the uh, new applications that are developed that way, like example, using, um, okay, I'll go to slow counting. That was a joke. <laughs> um, so um, I took over um, the usage pin counters issue, and I started reading back one year of discussions. Mostly Andreas had their discussions and Stan. So the idea is like, as uh, most probably most of you know, due to the MVCC implementation of Postgres, counting is slow. Uh, on one side, we have the concurrency problem where we want to set up set the timeouts in the uh, gitlab.com application as low as possible. I think it will go even lower. And on the other side, we are having more data and uh, we have several use cases where we have to have like, like let's say you wanna show the number of projects on a screen or you wanna show um, number of issues on a screen, it becomes impossible in uh, the you know Postgres uh, MVCC um, implementation, okay. So uh, I went back and investigated a lot of research. I started with a just a naive idea to just check if I can increase the timeout for usage pin counters. What are usage pin counters? So we have approximately 170 queries. Like whenever a product manager asks for a, a count on a self-hosted instance like, hey, I want to know the number of issues. I want to know the number of CI builds or CI pipelines. Then we end up not delivering it. Okay, so uh, increasing the statement timeout, um, the naive approach, I just verified it by uh, sending it to, you know, Andreas, Yorick, it was rejected, of course. Uh, basically, yeah, if you want to say anything, just. 
No, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, the main issue there I see is that we have these, you remember, wonderful metrics that select only blocks or gets blocked by alter, okay? That looks like you can have a select statement which is, let's say, 900 seconds. Uh, as long as you have, uh, naively, I was thinking, as long as you have an alter, you don't have an alter statement, which means you do migrations uh, less and you uh, do them concurrently, then I would have for some counts, I could have increased timeouts. However, there is this, um, um, first of all, there's this uh, log Q, which means that uh, like you have a select statement which takes 900 seconds. Then you have an alter statement coming and it's entering a log queue. Then you can have innocent updates and inserts which will pile up behind the alter. Am I right? Um, okay, so that's why practically uh, this matrix which says select does not you know, block anyone else is actually in a concurrent scenario doesn't mean anything. And also we are moving to continuous deployment. So that means we shall have, more, and we are having more developers. So we'll have more uh, migrations and more often per day. So at the end, I'm convinced that um, in the Postgres scenario, when you have over 10 million rows in any table, in any application, uh, and when you have a concurrency of like, like we have a, a few million users or uh, less than close to million monthly active users, we shall never be able to count in Postgres, okay? So that's the problem. Uh, and the solution, as far as I see, is uh, the best one seems to be the batch counting. Like Andreas actually went, you know, you can, count, you can talk now, Andreas, you went deep in efficient counters, but I like the batch counting approach just to have each individual batch in an acceptable timeout limit. So that, you know, if for usage ping, ping it's, it's very, it will work fine. Anyway, we have usage ping queries running every two weeks. So I don't have a problem. Uh, for other applications, uh, like, you know, you wanna show the number of projects on your screen, uh, batch counting might not be immediately appropriate. Okay, if you wish, Andres, if you want to talk about a bit your research. Sure, um, thanks for bringing it up. I, I um, think this is a really good discussion. Um, and it's so tempting to say that, oh, we, we, have, we do this just uh, so rarely, then uh, we, we just increase the timeouts. Um, but like you already explained, there is, there is quite a few things that are maybe not, not um, obvious from, from that. And um, I think the other point that we also discussed there was that um, even though you can do some measurements and you did a great job of, you know, uh, measuring the basically how long it takes to count a certain amount of rows on, on a certain system. Um, and you can, you can base a lot of that, but um, on the other hand, uh, the performance always depends on the system. So you, um, you might end up increasing the timeouts and we might see more results from that, which is good, obviously. Um, but at some point it might might degrade again or we, we will have this discussion come up again. Um, and uh, on other systems, it might not even work because the, the hardware might just be different or so, stuff like that. Um, there's also a reason why, why I liked the batch counting more. Um, I think it's quite uh, quite usable in that case because we, we don't care about the response time at all. We, we do that, we kick that off. Uh, if that takes two hours to, to perform the batch counting, then it's fine as well and we will get the numbers. Um, and they might be slightly inaccurate, um, but that's probably also okay in, the, in this case. Um, it's not usable for things where you where you want an, an exact count um, uh, in in an, in a in like in an instant where you, like you say, uh, uh, rendering the number of users, for example, we have that on the on the admin page in the backend or number of projects. Um, that wouldn't work uh, with batch counting because it just takes so long to complete. Um, Maybe just to reiterate on the batch counting, what what it, it's actually a very simple approach where you where you just uh, you don't you don't run one query to to perform the whole count, right? Um, so scanning the whole projects table, for example, to to uh, uh, get the count, but instead you look at it in batches and you just uh, count the number of records in, in the batches, um, and that can you can spread that over uh, 
multiple queries uh, outside of transactions. And then um, it takes a long time, maybe, maybe even longer than scanning the table once. Um, but you don't end up with like very long running statements. Yeah. What I like in batch counting here is that uh, the product managers uh, for small numbers, like the number of users, they want to be as exact as possible, which batch counting will ensure for large counts, like number of CI builds. I mean, they don't need that accurate and batch counting in that case will not be exact, but it's okay. I mean, so. mm -hmm. And I, I would guess it's much better than, than any of the approximate counting that we already have. Um, so we have all kinds of counting strategies, right? We can also, we can also use the Postgres statistics to, to um, basically figure out how, how big a relation is. That's something we also use in some places. Um, then there is table sample counting where you, you try to look at a subset of the table and, and then scale that up to the, um, yeah, to the full table size. Um, then we have batch counting. We have what we call efficient counters. Um, and this is actually a work in progress. I, I linked the MR, it's, uh, Fabio is working on that. Um, is is actually a model that, that works with MVCC uh, nicely, where you basically separate the incrementing the counters from um, consolidating them in the back end. Um, yeah, I get it. It's the project statistics or site statistics counter he's working yep. on. Yeah. Project statistics. Yeah, mm -hmm. Adam is, I just followed that. That's true. I went through all of that and all of your work. I think in that case, in, in the usage ping scenario, uh, when I, um, I'm just back from uh, vacation actually today. So when I develop that uh, page counter, I will send you. Um, I have several ideas there. Uh, could you make it generic so that per SQL query, which is normalized and canonical, could I get like a you know, edge counter strategy, uh, similar to Fabio's, you know, but generally, uh, mm -hmm. I will check it, you know, like you get it in a SQL query, you, oh, it can be like, it can have where clauses, distinct, whatever, but then you may be able to just store a edge counted version of the particular query with particular parameters, you know, mm -hmm. that's one nice. approach. One, uh, one thing which I'm, uh, I have to validate, I will check it and what, now what I have in my mind is that in the batch counter, do we rely exactly on the limit and offset? Um, that no, could I, slow I, down, that's what I'm afraid, I mean. No, you're right. Um, I think what we, the example that we had is a bit sim simplistic in, in the issues um, where we just use the Rails batch batching basically, um, and that is, as far as I know, is always based on the on the primary key. So you would you would not have um, large offsets for uh, batches, uh, you know, down the road. Um, but you'd you'd rather um, uh, base the. It's similar to key set pagination. You base it on on the primary key, and you have a greater greater than comparison um, to to retrieve that. Yeah, to retrieve that will that. have a trouble uh, in the sense that. It's not a trouble. I mean, it will take long because I made a test. So when I have a table which is 400 million rows and when I offset uh, higher, as you know, Andreas, from the page uh, pagination work you are doing. So as the you know, offset increases, even though the limit is um, uh, constant, it gets slower and slower. It goes up to one second even for you know uh, when you approach billion you know mm -hmm. in my test on the uh, archive copy um, replica of the live database for gitlab.com okay. mm -hmm. yeah that's that's always the case with the offset because um, you can't exclude all the data that you're not interested in you you have to scan all the relation until you reach that offset and that's that's the problem with with our default pagination strategy as well um, I think when you what would be good for batch counting is to maybe so to use the um, primary key for for the batching um, to avoid that and then secondly maybe there's a way to not retrieve all the records uh, for each of the batch because you're actually just interested in the count and typically uh, you would probably get a lot of batches that are full like always batch size number of records um, so maybe there is a way to just extract the 
maybe the maximum primary key that you see there and, and the actual count. So you only have to get one, one record back or one, one row. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the batch size here will be an interesting thing to work on. Like, uh, it, de it depends on the timeout, which, I mean, the time which I foresee for each batch, which should be what? Like, uh, what could be a nice number, as low as possible, of course. But, um, like, can I get, should I target 100 milliseconds, for example, for each batch? It's a good question. Um, when I have a thousand batches. You know. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, let's start. It probably depends on on also what time you can tolerate for the overall counting, uh, you know, for the usage ping. Yeah, and also I'm afraid for larger, larger tables. Sometimes, uh, do we have primary keys for them? I saw some discussions that for very large tables, um, like some CI table, I don't remember exactly, but the primary key was removed or was planned to remove being removed, especially when you approach of four billions and you don't need it, you know, like jobs or that will also make things difficult for some. Uh, yes, there, there was an issue with the primary key that was short before overflowing, I think, and that's why we removed it. But in the end, uh, we always have a unique key or a primary key on, on the table. Otherwise we're making, we should fix that. Um, because, you know, table without a, a unique uh, identifier is uh, not great. So that should always be there. I'm curious, um, when it comes to the batch queries, does partitioning a table by like what you plan on doing that batch query by, would that enhance that performance at all? I mean, I know that that also might mess with the performance of other queries on the table, but I'm just kind of curious if that would have an effect on, on that type of query. What kind of partitioning uh, do you have in mind? Um, I mean, like if you're trying to do batches by, um, I guess if you, like, I, I think of like, I, I've seen partitioning by dates where it's like you partition every month and then you can do a batch by, if you do like greater than the start of the month, um, for each month, um, I'm not sure if that helps that performance or not, but, um, it's just something that kind of floated in my head. I was curious. Oh yeah. Um, Maybe let's, the, the other example is you partition by the primary key. Um, so you have the first 10,000 uh, IDs in one, one partition and then the next and so on. And then uh, when you run queries like, uh, give me all the records that have an ID greater than something, then uh, you, can, you, can, you benefit from it because then you can exclude the partitions that don't match it. That's right, yeah. One other thing which is we don't need to discuss here, I was thinking that do we need a transaction? We are, I mean, GitLab is uh, focusing more and more on Git transaction processing. Maybe we could have an analytics processing database for some tables or for some Git aggregation, longer timeouts. Uh, and I was thinking about it and uh, the things which make it complicated is that we have the self-hosted, we have now Periscope, SciSense. Uh, we have a data team, which is more or less in the, at least in the name, in the all up data warehouse or data part. Uh, I think it's not immediately possible, at least in GitLab context. But for the future, we may at least uh, maybe think to have a uh, analytics processing database with longer timeouts, with aggregations, or we can use Elasticsearch database for that purpose uh, at some point. Because there's sort of two situations. One is for us as a company to, to analyze GitLab.com, which is uh, the largest instance that we have and maybe causing the most problems. And then on the other hand, there are like features in GitLab itself where we, where we, we tend to do more analytics kind of queries. Um, so that that might be different different aspects of that, right? And we already we already mirror the data into uh, what's it called again the the data warehouse that we use. 
Um, so we can already run the analytical queries for us um, on, on this database instead of going to, to the production cluster. What's it called again? I must have forgotten. <laughs> Normal. If anyone has any brilliant idea on Postgres efficient counters, just drop me a line because I have to have telemetry to, um, and also there are the other issues. Um, let's say you want to count distinct users across tables, like distinct users on a union of tables. People who are doing pipelines and issues. Uh, there is, we have this SMAO definition uh, which is now currently given up because of the database performance risk. I didn't make that decision, by the way. Uh, but you know, the idea is that like you want to count the number of distinct users across issues, CI builds, CI pipelines, creators, you know, assignees, stuff like that. If you have any idea over there, you can drop me a line over there. Not totally sure about the context, but the uh, HLL extension might be interesting to look at if you don't know it yet. No, I will check it. I read it from your links actually for a long time. You were linking uh, HLL, Hyperlock. Mm -hmm. Adam, would you like to talk about the materialized view uh, idea? Yeah, yeah. So this was just, I was pinged on this uh, MR. Uh, so it looks like somebody's trying to uh, fix. Uh, there was an issue about from the admin interface, we had a timeout because we couldn't count the users. And the idea is to use the materialized view feature from Postgres to periodically, basically, it's like an in memory table refresh. Uh, the counts and use that table to, to provide the volume for the for the admin view, and it's just a proof of concept. And uh, yeah, I was surprised that there was uh, already a gem supporting uh, this Postgres feature. So ideally, we could even start using it without switching to this uh, structure SQL file. So putting the the schema RB uh, and for for caching counts it could be could be an interesting approach counts that we don't need to be always like 100 percent up to date mm -hmm. yeah good link uh, thanks adam i actually also uh, worked on materials materialized view as an alternative uh, the only problem there is that uh, the updates manual or i don't know the way you read for materialized views also have some locking and concurrence problem. Um, especially in usage ping, we have like 170 SQL queries, which is touching every page, uh, every user uh, screen, you know. Like, um, that's the risk which I saw, but I will follow that, uh, you know, uh, MR, and I wanna know like how it goes through. I haven't looked into materialized views recently, but um, is it is it correct to think that the uh, refreshing would still? I know it's it can be done concurrently, but um, the uh, calculating the data is, is equivalent to to actually a long running uh, select in this case, right? I think so. I haven't checked it, but I'm fairly sure it will also put a lock on the on the table. So it's, it's basically I'm not sure that it times out or not. So. Maybe the statement will block until the, the refresh is done or it will do it in the background. I'm not sure I need, to, I need to check that, but if it blocks, then I guess we will just hit the statement timeout at some point. Yeah. Um, so uh, scaling Postgres video YouTube series, maybe you have seen um, like there's a, um, there's a creator, YouTube creator who is um, uh, like aggregating several uh, articles and 
right before uh, today in the morning, coming back from vacation, I was reading it and um, he has an article, which I'm gonna find now, put in the pointers, which discusses on the uh, log problems with the materialized use. I think it's again from situs data as usual. So thanks, Ron. Like if usage, uh, we can go to the next agenda. I will anyway have a new MR and I will ping you in case, or just if you have an idea, write me on Slack. This is a long-term problem for telemetry, which will, you know. Also a long-standing problem. So yeah. thanks for bringing that up. Um, uh, the rest of the agenda, I just put a few points I found interesting to note. Um, there was, uh, Nick did a great summary on the Postgres checkup report and it's also a quick reminder that we have these. Um, so this is a weekly automated report that we get. Um, and quite a few interesting things uh, in there if you wanna take a look. And Nick's summary is also a great read. On the next point, uh, Albert, you can probably talk much better to that than I can. Uh, I just wanted to bring it up because um, I found those numbers very interesting. Yeah. Um, so um, um, in the telemetry team or in the product growth team, um, we have to know like how big are self-hosted instances. And I thought that might be interesting and I posted on the database Slack channel and maybe Andreas saw it there. So uh, the idea is that uh, GitLab.com is huge and the next, um, okay, due to usage ping counters timing out, we usually end up getting minus one for CI tables. So that's why I went and I just got the safe bet, which is the issues table. And I went back like uh, when it's less than 20 million, the risk of a timeout is low. So based on the number of issues, um, GitLab.com has 22 million issues at the moment I took it and the next large instances have um, half a million and less okay so so it's 37 times like GitLab.com is 37 times larger than the next largest self-hosted instance which is pinging in the usage ping so we might have some other self-hosted instances who have who are bigger and most probably they would have DBAs and they would be more inclined to disable the usage ping. Okay, so we have some. Uh, and second, the number of users. Uh, it's again like the next largest self-hosted instance has 14 times less users than GitLab.com which has 5 million users. And also I saw that a cluster of like self-hosted instances, which are two types, two clusters. Uh, it's not a conclusion. On one side, we have like um, GitLab self-hosted instances, which are used as um, issue management systems for large uh, applications. Like, and on the other side, we have CI pipelines and like so, uh, sometimes you have uh, a large instance with a lot of users and a lot of issues but they have no CI builds or pipelines so we have I think in the use case for self hosts at least for the large uh, companies or large use cases we have two general types like issues boards uh, world auditing things and users, kind of they are using it as an issue tracker most probably. And then we have the um, CI uh, type of usage. Okay. Do you know for the, for the CI side, um, do you know similar comparison? For the CI, um, I, due to this timeout issue on the you know, usage ping, 
the large instances have minus one, minus one. Oh, <laughs> so, oh yeah. It's a highly biased data set, I guess. Yeah. It's extremely biased. So I couldn't use the CI builds table or pipelines table, mm -hmm. yeah, unfortunately. Like uh, sometimes you have a very little project, like you have less than 1,000 projects, but you have like they have hundreds of thousands of CI builds, you know, just in one project or 10. Maybe they are an old instance, you know, they got, I mean, <laughs> no strong conclusions because of the usage being timeouts. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but still, still interesting numbers. Uh... And curious to to find out um, how long it actually would take to to count to batch count the ACI builds table, for example. Um, ah, it's, um, like um, there's an interesting thing: the table size and the I think vacuum situation makes a difference. When I select count on GitLab.com replica uh, live replica, um, the top count for CI builds, I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it should be, I put it somewhere actually in, in one of the issues. Um, I mean, nothing is more than six minutes actually, like largest table. There is a table which you know, it's uh, more than three, two billion, which was it today? It was the topic in one of the issues, Andreas. Uh, defaults for- Yeah, defaults, for example, counting that one is quite easy. I don't know why, like, uh, that's uh, like counting up to 2 billion is quicker than counting uh, a few uh, hundred millions. That also shows like vacuum or storage layout or... I, I think there is an explanation there uh, because I think the metrics defaults, is, those are mostly blobs, right? Um, and the blobs are not stored on the... Um, or the larger blobs are not stored on the on the actual table; they are toasted. Um, so there, there's a separate table basically where you keep the, the blob data. So while you might end up having like two billions of uh, records on that table, the actual table size for the counting um, might actually be much smaller. So the data that you have to read is much, maybe much smaller than for a another table that is only 100 million uh, but has a lot of data in it. That might be just I'm not sure, but it might be an explanation. Yeah, um, I have a list of, uh, in, in the first issue for the slow usage count, uh, like counting merge request diff commits, which is 2.2 billion rows on gitlab.com, takes uh, average, like I counted 10 times, and I need to count, you know, cold actually, because usage ping is cold, but it's quite difficult to make it cold, because once you run it, you have a warm cache situation, but it takes 400 seconds um, at most. And, um, and div files take 600 milliseconds. So nothing takes more than uh, 600, uh, 600 seconds in mm -hmm. gitlab.com. So you can find the uh, uh, detailed analysis on the first issue in the slow counting. Uh, let me push there. Okay, that's the merge request. Shoot, shoot count. Yep. Perfect. Thanks. Um, and maybe just as an additional thought, the a drawback from the batch counting is when you think about how it works. Um, is you you also read all the data from from the table, right? So. Um, you you might end up evicting a lot of caches because because you scan the this uh, you scan the table once so that that is a slight drawback from from that approach and mm -hmm. I think the nicest solution in that regard is really that you have just one counter that you can read um, but it's a bit difficult to to implement yeah um, you know uh, reading back all the literatures uh, on the internet and all the discussions I didn't see a magic solution but I still hope for it because you know, like um, maybe um, uh, copying some tables in a temp table and then copying it out of uh, transaction processing and then counting there could be a solution. I don't know if anyone has an idea anyway, I'm open. I just started on this issue. Yeah.
All right, and the, the last note I wanted to make is uh, a addition to the docs from uh, Steve. Thanks for that. Um, so Steve's pointing out that in case of one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships, we can actually maybe skip the primary key and just use the foreign key as the primary key, which makes total sense that so we can spare the, the column for that. So maybe that's something, um, we don't have any like tests for that, right? Uh, but something we can look out for uh, in, in reviews or when we look at migrations. All right, any other topics, thoughts, ending lines? If not, then thanks for uh, the chat and uh, yep, see you next time. Uh, actually, um, next time is next week because I, I skipped last week. Uh, we can see if we have any topics for next week. If you don't, then we can reschedule for sure. All right, have a nice day. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay.